Amen. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Lisa. As we come together to worship on this Sunday, I wonder if more than one of us is exhausted. I know that if I was to think of some words to describe myself in this season, I'm not, you know, physically exhausted, but there is a level of exhaustion. And I suspect that others in our congregation also feel some measure of exhaustion. If you've read any books, if you've watched any movies, perhaps you've seen that when things are dire, when they are at their end, when they are thin, out of hope, if you will, the only hope that remains is hope of escape, of salvation that comes. We use the term deus ex machina. It kind of comes out of nowhere, this salvation that comes and kind of saves the, the heroes, the good guys. I suspect that there are many in our world, in our country, in our cities, right now that are feeling this level of exhaustion, desiring escape for salvation. And I think it's especially poignant for us then to be meeting on this Sunday of all Sundays. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day in which we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. When the church took on, birthed into its mission and purpose by the Holy Spirit, gifted to be able to serve in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the gift of salvation that comes from on high. Yet, as we read in 1 Peter, we aren't taken out of the suffering that we experience in this world. And so I think that this book, this text, is particularly relevant to our season. And we've been going through a series of sermons looking at First Peter. The first four Sundays, we looked at the foundation of what it means to be a Christian, described by Peter, who lives in a secular world in which we perhaps don't feel as welcome as we would like. We are chosen but God, chosen by God, but exiled into a world that is not our home. We are sent there. And it is while we are sent there that we are to be holy as God is holy. And so we looked at redefining that holiness. And in the midst of that, we pay attention to the living hope that God gives us. We are born anew, as Henry read this morning, into a living hope. And then the fourth foundation was the identity component of suffering that Christians face in this life. So those four foundational identities, and now we're paying attention to the four capacities that the church needs to develop in order to witness faithfully in a season such as we find ourselves. The first capacity was the capacity of liturgy. We live in a world that has found, figured out that human beings are liturgical beings and that you can shape what a human being loves if you get them to practice your rituals, your liturgies. And so we looked at various liturgies that shape our loves and we gave attention to how the church needs to develop the capacity, reinforce the capacity, to do our liturgies, to shape and form our loves so that we love what God loves, so that we follow him. And then Doug, last Sunday, led us through theology, the, ca the capacity of the church to do theology. It's not something you do on your own, but it's something that we do together. All of us are theologians. And Doug led us through that so very well. I encourage you, if you missed it, go back and take a listen and be inspired to learn what it means to be a theologian in and for the church. We do this together. And then today, we're looking again at hope, which we paid attention to in the second Sunday of the sermon series. We're coming back, circling around to hope, because I think Peter draws us to pay attention. As Peter highlights what it means to have a living hope, he also puts it in context of the re very real suffering that his readers were going through. Hope against the backdrop of suffering and lament. So let me pray, and then we'll dive into what Peter is leading us to. Father God Almighty, we ask that you would be with us this morning, that you would be with all Christians across the earth. By your word this morning, and through the precious gift of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would illumine our minds, rekindle our hearts, and strengthen our wills. In your name we pray. 
Amen. Before I proceed with what I wanted to talk about, um, last Sunday I was hosting, and in the pastoral prayers, I prayed for Palestine in particular and for the Christians in that area. And I just wanted to let you guys know that a lot of what I prayed there came out of communication that I have with a man named Jack Sarah. He's the president of Bethlehem Bible College. And in 2020, I was scheduled to visit there and to be part of a conference that my dad would have been speaking at, and I would have had the chance to uh, tour Israel with Jack Sarah and to visit his church, which is the East Jerusalem Alliance Church. So we are an Alliance Church, and this is one of our sister churches in the world, located right in East Jerusalem. And so my prayers come based on my conversations with them, and I hope over the course of the next few weeks, months, maybe even years, our conversations with this church can develop into a relationship. Right now, they need our support. They need our prayers, and they need us to encourage them however we're able. So I will continue to lean into that relationship that God has brought into my life in this season. Peter talks about hope. He introduces us to the idea of a living hope in verse 3. And then later in the text, he talks about suffering, the suffering that we will be doing with Christ, on behalf of Christ, suffering in such a manner like Christ suffered. We, he, is, he calls us to that. And that in so doing, we are strengthened by God and in God. Peter names, he talks about the hardship that the people of God will be going through. This is a form of lament. And it's within that context, it's with the, the lament, the suffering present, the reality named as the backdrop, that he calls us to hope. Why do we need hope? Why is it so important? I think if you were on a construction site and it turned out that there was no more wood, you had used all your wood, you would experience the same feeling as someone who's trying to build and encourage their fellow believers. If you don't have wood, you don't have the ability to do any further construction. And I think as believers in Christ, if we don't have hope, we don't have the ability to build one another up more and more into the maturity that we are called to in Christ. Without hope, we will not become the men and the women that God would like to shape us to be. For each one of us, we would miss out. Without hope, we would not proceed along the path that we would, could grow into the fullness of who God has desired us to be, and he's trying to help us become all that we are to be. If we don't have hope, we kind of stay by the wayside, and we don't enter into what he's calling us to be. And if that happens, we miss out, and the world misses out. Without hope, we erode, we descend, we do not rise up. Hope is an essential ingredient for us as individuals and for us as a congregation. A hope that things can be better, a hope for change, a hope that you can make a difference and a hope that you can have fun, that you can be safe and secure, or that you can be free, that you could feel joy. Hope for you, for all of us together, is hope for life itself and for flourishing. In a season such as we find ourselves, as we, throughout the pandemic, have heard, participated in, recognized racism deep in the roots of our civilization, perhaps we've lost hope that it can be solved. As we see how corporate interests can pass over, can oppress, can lead to situations where the livelihood of the non-corporate engaged person is sacrificed for corporate interests. Perhaps you have seen that in this pandemic. And perhaps you are losing hope. We can be moved to a place of despair when hope is not present. And I think we are particularly vulnerable, those of us who have heard of God's shalom, of God's peace, we are particularly vulnerable to the sin of despair because we have a sense of what things should be like. 
We have a sense of all the goodness that God offers us. We have a taste even of who God is and how much he loves us and we long for his kingdom to come. And so, because we have a sense of that, perhaps we are more vulnerable to despair than if we hadn't. In the space of despair, there is a loss of creativity and of innovation that becomes non-existent because there is no sense that things can change or become better. So hope is an essential ingredient. It's like a construction element necessary to being able to build the body of the church. Because of its necessity, I think we are also vulnerable to false hope. And what I want to do is I want to chat about false hope and then turn around and see how Peter calls us to authentic hope. False hope, I think, is so dangerous. Our desire for hope, our desire for things to be well, I think makes us vulnerable to a false hope, a hope that, if you will, papers over reality. It tells us everything is going to be okay. Jessica Riddle wrote an article about toxic positivity versus critical hope. And in her article and in another one, you get these lines such as, you've probably heard these before. Perhaps when facing something difficult, somebody has said to you, you know, you'll get over it. Or why don't you try to be happy? Stop being so negative. Oh, you should never give up. And you should always see the good in everything. And perhaps we've not only heard these lines, we may have offered them because we're not sure how to offer something better. We've been kind of trained up in this way of, let's be positive. And what we're doing there is we're often trying to get people to move past their discomfort quickly on our timeline. I used to play field hockey quite a bit. I love field hockey, and I think it's a spectacular sport that is underrepresented in the world. Well, underrepresented in Canada, perhaps. In field hockey, you can't let the ball touch your feet. If the ball touches your feet, the whistle blows, and it's immediately the other team's ball. Unless, of course, you kick the ball towards your own net, and the other team's quite happy to score, the whistle won't blow, and they'll allow that, allow that to happen. But for the most part, the ball may not touch your feet. And I played a lot of field hockey, and I also refed a lot of field hockey. And there's a situation that can occur, and the better the player, the easier it is to do this. You're playing with a one-sided stick, and you have to use one side both to, to direct the ball. And you can kind of move the ball towards the other player, draw it back, and then move it again very quickly as their feet adjust to the movement of the ball. And you can catch them off guard and roll the ball into their feet, whistle blows, and now that person has to back off and give you space because you get a free hit. You can manufacture the foul. It turns out this is illegal in field hockey. The manufactured foul is illegal. It's very hard to call. You kind of have to judge the intent, and it happens very quickly. And if you ever do call it, I learned as a ref, you get quite yelled at. <laughs> People don't believe that they have manufactured the foul, even when they were definitely trying to. Can we identify manufactured hope? Because I think it should be illegal for us. When despair seems present, it's so desirable to have hope that we are vulnerable to a false hope that can be manufactured. What does it look like? Well, in the short term, a manufactured hope is, ten, tends to be inward looking, either towards me or towards my group, my team. Primarily, the manufactured hope is my team focused. Manufactured hope is also recognizable because it's really dependent on, it really feeds off of signs of power. Yes, Jesus did do signs of power, but as often as not, don't forget, he was trying to tell people, keep this silent, keep it a little bit quiet. My big sign of power is my crucifixion. That's the one you really need to get, if you will. Manufactured hope feeds off of desires, tries to look intently for signs of power. 
manufactured hope is also recognizable in its relationship to fear and anger. It kind of feeds off of fear and anger. You see, if there is fear present, false hope can be more easily created. And so fear can actually be built up by the same group or person or idea in your mind that's trying to create this manufactured hope. So if fear seems to increase in volume, perhaps the hope that is increasing alongside it is manufactured and needs to be questioned. As often as not, we can say, look out, there's other humans who want to win against us. They want to take from us. They want to change our way of life. But don't worry, we'll overcome. Fear creates more need for this manufactured hope. Also, manufactured hope is also recognizable in whom it applies to. As often as not, manufactured hope actually applies to people who are pretty much already doing just fine. Manufactured hope often will exclude people in the minority. It will exclude people in the margins or who don't fit the image of success. Manufactured hope becomes, it looks, it has a very distinct look of what it, the success is looking like. And if you don't quite fit, well, you're an exception to what we're looking for here to justify our hope. So you're kind of gonna be de-voiced, if you will. If you can't say a story of positivity that matches the desire of hope, you will be asked not to share your story and your voice will be diminished. Manufactured hope can be recognized because it is not inclusive, but actually a little bit more narrow in scope. And manufactured hope is also recognizable when it fails, if you can see when it fails. Manufactured hope will result in shame. Very quickly though, that shame will turn to anger and then to blame and scapegoating. Manufactured hope that sees a chink in its armor, if you will, will go shame, anger, blame, and scapegoating in order to protect the manufactured hope. And lastly on manufactured hope, what is the method? <laughs> How do you get it? and you get it through hype. And as we think about the capacity of the church to be a place of hope, I think it is incredibly important for churches to recognize the difference between hype and hope. Hype as the method of manufactured hope, of false hope. Perhaps you've seen a college coach do a pep talk Perhaps you've seen a Hollywood movie in which a college coach does a pep talk. Well, the college coach pep talk has changed because of Hollywood, because of the movies in which we have the great challenge from the coach that then the team goes out and overcomes the opponent. Now we have college coaches saying, I need to make my speeches look as awesome as the ones in Hollywood. It has become, if you will, its own liturgy its own ritual of how to win against seemingly insurmountable odds. Don't let your team believe that they can lose. Hype it up. This liturgy, this ritual of hype has seeped into different places in our life. You'll see it in, well, you can see it in a big box store in the way it treats its employees. We're gonna hype things up in order to get you ready for the day. You can see it in churches. You can see it in denominations. You can see it across Christianity if you look for it. There are spaces and places where hype has supplanted or been exchanged for what we need, which is hope. Hype, unfortunately, results over time in a diminished hope. Hype becomes dependent upon the response of the people you're talking to. When you hype up the team, you expect them to cheer loudly and to really get engaged. And if they don't, you kind of feel like maybe you didn't quite do your job well. You're really looking for that. Hype is extremely kind of codependent on this charge experience. Whereas hope is much more resilient it's not so in the moment, I need this feedback of hype. 
How do we break through this? How do we break through manufactured hope through hype? How do you make authentic hope possible? Well, I think that manufactured hope or hype is present in places where we don't recognize or pay full attention to the presence of sin, to the consequences of sin, to the reality of sin in our world. What we need is lament in order to break through manufactured hope. Jesus tells us in his Sermon on the Mount, which we went through last year during Lent, he tells us, blessed are those who mourn, for they, and I read as Daryl Johnson does here, for they and only they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then in John chapter 11, when Lazarus dies, one of the most precious verses in the Bible, it's really just one word in Greek. It's two words in the English translation. He wept. Never lose sight of this verse in your life. He wept. In the spaces of toxic positivity, No lament is allowed. Hype has no place for critical thinking. You're not allowed to raise your hand and say, you know what, but they've got Peyton Manning as the quarterback. Could we actually talk about how he's effective as a quarterback? No, we're just going to kind of talk about how amazing winning is going to be. Critical thinking, critical questions are not welcome in a culture of hype. There's also no space to acknowledge loss in a place of manufactured hope. No discouraging word is heard at this home on the range. Manufactured hope is afraid of tears and anger. I had the opportunity to have a conversation with somebody who's experienced and is experiencing what it means to go through freedom sessions. If you don't know about freedom sessions, I encourage you to chat with myself or someone else in the church who knows about Freedom Sessions. Clint, I'm going to volunteer you there because, well, you're wonderful and you talk so well about Freedom Sessions, if everyone is curious. Freedom Sessions has one of the practices where when somebody else shares their story, you're not allowed to kind of jump in and give them advice. (laughs) Have you ever sat with somebody who's going through something incredibly uncomfortable? Your desire is to immediately jump in and say, I think I have the solution for you. Here's how we can solve your problem. Let's let's get past crying about it and let's move on to solutions. Freedom Sessions kind of by rule tells you to let the person sit with it. Don't shortcut their mourning. Don't shortcut what they're going through just because you're uncomfortable with them processing their emotions visibly. There is a desire to shortcut tears and anger. Lament, by contrast, opens the door to radical reconciliation by naming the realities. Perhaps you noticed in the last week that there was a measure of peace that was gained in the Middle East. The bombs have stopped dropping for now. What level of hope can we have in this season? What level of hope can we have that violence will not erupt again in Palestine and Israel? For myself, I will have very little hope of that until and only if there is authentic lament where the injustices are named, where the thousands of lives lost of the Palestinians are named, and the hundred of lives lost of the Israelis are named. Until we authentically lament openly, we cannot have hope of reconciliation. We cannot have hope of true peace. In South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission went through a, a 
trying to figure out how do we lament and name the stories? How do we hear them in order to move towards reconciliation? And it's a stunning testimony to how lament opens the door to authentic reconciliation in places and spaces where incredible, horrific things had happened. Here in Canada, similarly, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission began with story. And it's when we avoid the story because we don't want to hear it, we don't want to enter into it, we don't want to feel the emotion, that we shortcut it, that we evade authentic reconciliation. Lament opens the door to radical reconciliation. Because without lament, resentment fosters. Gossip fosters. And the break, the divide cannot be resolved. Without lament, we seek vengeance instead. Anger festers. With lament, we have the opportunity to form and shape in meekness. To let God be God, to let him be the one who is the, the author of justice. When lament is present, meekness can be formed in our bodies. First Peter, the author Peter, directs us towards hope. But he speaks to us about the suffering that the Christians are experiencing. And he also talks about how the Christians are meant to engage in the society around them. He speaks to them in such a way that they are to be examples, they are to be present witnesses to Jesus Christ, and that they aren't to act in fear and anger. He never talks about their situation as something to be fearful or angry about. Authentic hope interacts with fear and anger by not really being affected by it. Fear and anger cannot change the path of someone who is marked by authentic hope. Authentic hope actually insulates you from this fear and anger. Lament creates the backdrop and authentic hope drives us forward. In verses 3, 14, 15, and 16, Peter writes to us and he says this, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? Even if you are suffering for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Authentic hope. Against the backdrop of lament. Authentic hope is not twisted by fear and anger, but instead is formed, as he says here, Peter, in gentleness, love, and compassion. Love and compassion impact the actions that come from someone who lives in authentic hope. Who is authentic hope for, in contrast to manufactured hope, which seem to have a narrowing who is authentic hope for? Authentic hope is marked by inclusiveness. It draws people together. Always have a word. Always be able to defend the hope that is in you, says Peter. Authentic hope is directed particularly towards those who have suffered injustice. Authentic hope gives hope to the people who really need it. The minority, the weak, the vulnerable, the brokenhearted, the least of these. You can tell authentic hope because it gives hope to those who need it most. And the method of authentic hope is the method of honor, virtue, and integrity. In 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter writes to us and he tells us that it's important to suffer for doing good. Don't suffer because you've done wrong. Suffer for doing what is good. And in 4 verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or even a mischief maker. And the word mischief maker is somebody who meddles in other people's affairs. Interesting to pair that with murderer. Yet if any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it disgrace, but glorify God because you bear his name. Doing the right thing in the right way, Peter draws our attention to. This is the method of authentic hope. There's no cutting corners with authentic hope. You need to first make sense of grief 
And having sat there, you can then proceed to authentic hope. We don't camp in despair or grief as Christians, but through faith. Faith just always gives hope. It leads to hope. And hope has a spectacular ability for doubt to even be present. If you have ever been in a space of either manufactured hope or hype, you know that hype has a hardness to it where doubt is not allowed. As I mentioned earlier, critical thinking is not allowed or doubt. But hope has no such boundary to it. Hope is so resilient and strong that doubt and critical thinking is even welcomed because hope has no fear, as Peter led us to. Authentic hope cannot be manufactured. Instead, it is something that we receive. Hope is something that we receive. And I think it's incredibly important to remember this on Pentecost Sunday, because it is the Holy Spirit that gives us hope. And if we looked at manufactured hope, how it results in blame, anger, shame, and scapegoating, it results in a diminishment of hope. It results in this hype that, res that relies upon the interaction of others agreeing with our hype, if you will. Authentic hope gives life to those who are even on the outside who need it most, and it will produce creativity and innovation. Hype will produce repetitive innovation, at best variations on a theme. Hype is where you see sequels and prequels happen. And this can happen in movies, as you know. Let's, you know, do an animated version of a, a live version of an animated movie because we know it's going to make money. That's hype. Hope, on the other hand, creates innovation, the space for it. Authentic hope is actually a culture that is marked by openness to experimentation. And artists flourish in a space where authentic hope is welcome. I think it is incredibly important for the church to be a place that develops the capacity for authentic hope. Hope against the backdrop of lament, because without that backdrop of lament, it is a lie, the hope is, and will actually diminish our capacity for authentic hope. So as a body, we need to make space for lament to be part of our liturgical practice. In order for our hope to be authentic, I am struck by how many times I have heard somebody say, having lost someone they loved or having something horrible happen in their life, they didn't come to Sunday that week. I just couldn't face the other people there. Could you imagine if you worshiped at a church where somebody in their deep sadness felt like church was the place they simply had to be? They didn't want to miss it. But so often in our culture and in our church culture, the person who enters in there gets surrounded and put upon in a way that doesn't help them to experience the lament. I wonder how we could as a church. I don't have the answer here. I am wondering out loud, how could we as a church be a place where our liturgy of space incorporates lament so the person who is the most sad feels the most welcome? For ourselves as individuals, I think we can all do training in this authentic hope. Training in our ability to be encouraged, to be encourageable, to be able to find hope. The easiest way to train this is to train ourselves in patience. We live in a culture of liturgies of instant gratification. So if you want to train yourself in authentic hope, train yourself in patience. You can do this through bird watching. You can do this through experiencing gardening. You have to plant it. You have to wait for it to grow. Find the ways and means of training yourself in patience, such as waiting for something to happen. I had to wait 15 minutes after getting the vaccine on Friday. I took that as an opportunity. I looked around myself and noticed everybody is here on their phones. It's hard to wait in our culture. So I took it as an opportunity. One preacher had given me this many years ago. When you're waiting in line or when you're waiting in a hockey arena surrounded by other people on chairs, what can I do here? I can pray for each of the people around me. 
I just choose that person, look at who they are, and pray for them, and then pray for the next person. And the waiting for me becomes a development in patience, and I know now, in authentic hope. Also, to develop authentic hope, one of the things that we can do is just show up. In this season, more than perhaps in others, it's more easy to identify when people aren't showing up. And so for each one of you who are present today, you've made the space to be present here on the Sunday morning. You are giving a gift to your fellow believers. By attending, by presenting yourself, I'm here with you. By just showing up, you are testifying to your brother or sister that you are not alone. You are participating in building authentic hope together by just showing up. And no matter how no matter how thin you feel things are for you in this world right now, there is a space and a place and a practice that you can do each morning. It's Pentecost Sunday, remember this. The Holy Spirit is with you. And as you wake up in the morning, just open your hands and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm looking forward to this morning to receive from you what you would give to me today. This simple practice This simple practice of opening your hands to receive as the first thing you do in the morning will train you an authentic hope because you're looking to see Christ today. If you can do nothing else, open your hands and ask Christ to be present to you. The closing words of 1 Peter that Henry read for us offer us words to live by in this season and in all seasons. That we we would be a people who are faithfully trusting God, that we are hoping in God, and that through this hope and in this hope we discipline ourselves and resist evil, suffering together with one another, greeting one another to encourage one another. As he writes in his letter, all the greetings that he has with his friends and co-workers to the others. We are in this together, and it is through the gift of the Holy Spirit given to us to develop in us, to gift us with authentic hope, that we will find peace and shalom in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.